I'm Maya Sheetreet Klein. I'm a pediatric neurologist and an herbalist and a naturalist and the author of The Dirt Cure, Healthy Food, Healthy Gut, Happy Child. And I came to this journey of integrative health probably pretty early. I was actually um, first interested in becoming a psychoneuroimmunologist when I watched a Bill Moyer special called Healing and the Mind when I was in college and I thought, wow, I want to work with mind, body and, you know, think of the body as physical, emotional and spiritual. And there was this field apparently called psychoneuroimmunology. So I went to med school. I wrote about it in my med school essay. They somehow let me in. Once I got to med school, I kind of got lost in all the things you have to do to become a doctor. And I got very caught up in, I, had, I got married, I had three kids over the course of my pediatrics training and, and neurology training. But once I finished, or I was close to finishing, um, my youngest child developed uh, very severe breathing issues that appeared to be like asthma. And no one was really able to help me figure out what it was or why it was happening. And I felt pretty desperate um, because not only did he have the breathing issues, but he also had a huge developmental plateau at the same time where um, he started to fall all the time and got like very clumsy and wouldn't catch himself. So he lost his like protective reflexes and he stopped gaining new words at that time as well. So I obviously became really worried and yet all the great doctors and colleagues that I took him to basically had nothing to say. They just said, well, you know, he's going to be fine. Um, or he's a reactive kid. Or, you know, well, there's nothing that much to do right now, just watch. And what I ultimately found was that he was uh, severely allergic to soy. And when we took him off of soy, his breathing problems totally reversed. And after 10 months of constant issues and constant medications. So at that point, I realized how powerful food could be. And in addition to that, realized how important it was um, that the gut and the immune system and the brain were also deeply connected to each other. And I wanted to be able to bring that to not just my family, um, but to my patients and the larger community as well. So. Any time that you practice medicine um, differently than how everyone else does it, you're going to get the shaming, you're going to get angry colleagues, you're going to have a lot of general disapproval. And I mean, I think there was a lot of, well, show me the science for that. And then you show them the science. Uh, my book has over 700 references. And they say, you call that science? So. It, it's definitely a journey. You have to have pretty thick skin to do things differently than other people do, but um, it would be impossible for me to do it any other way. My book is about really about the concept of dirt, which is three things. It's being exposed to germs and microbes, it's eating fresh food from healthy soil, and it's getting out into nature. And that is definitely the foundation of what I do with my patients. And my patients can come in with all kinds of issues. They come in with autism or ADHD or um, learning disabilities, explosive behavior, OCD, um, tics or pandas, um, which is sort of a, a combo of tics, anxiety, and OCD, um, seizure disorder. So we really have the gamut walking through the door. And then there are the kids who have things that no one can figure out. And they've been to lots and lots and lots of different places. And the job that I do is really a lot of detective work. So it's, first of all, sometimes to figure out what the real problem is, but especially to work backwards and figure out what the root cause is. And so often, the root cause is related to what the kids are eating and um, really their exposure, not getting enough exposure to very diverse organisms and foods and experiences outdoors because that's what our bodies and brains crave. We have thought for 
a long time now that being sanitary and being hygienic and being sterile was what we needed in order to be healthy. But it turns out that we have this entity called the microbiome, which is three to five pounds of bacteria and other uh, organisms that live in and on our body. And it turns out also that these organisms are orchestrating in, in relationship with our body, many, many, many healthy um, cycles and they basically keep us healthy. So from our gut, they're regulating how we digest and our immune system in our gut, from our immune system, which is in constant conversation with all these different diverse organisms, hopefully diverse organisms, and our brain. So there's a whole field of study now called psychobiotics, where pharmaceutical companies are basically investigating the impact of microbes on our mood and our cognition and the way that we think and feel. So basically being exposed to all of these organisms is critically important. Meanwhile, kids are washing their hands with antibacterial soap. They're on antibiotics at the drop of a hat. The houses are being cleaned with bleach. We use dishwashers instead of using sponges, which actually have bacteria that are ben potentially really beneficial because we need a lot of diverse organisms. Um, and kids are indoors so much, whether it's because they're on screens or because of stranger danger or because they have a lot of homework, whatever it is, they're not getting that diverse exposure to microorganisms that are really very critical for gut, immune, and brain health. There's actually studies that have looked at children who live in urban apartments and compared them to children who live on farms and looked at the diversity of organisms and how many bacteria live in each environment. And it turns out that there's an equal number of bacteria that live in the urban apartment as compared to the farm. But the difference is that children who live on farms have far more diverse exposure to bacteria. And that's why children who live on farms are a lot less likely to have allergies, asthma, autoimmune conditions, and other things. And they're actually much better prepared to fight infection as well, because when they have such a broad array of organisms, it means that no one organism is going to grow out of control. And a lot of people might wonder, is there danger to touching like the pole in the subway, which probably has a lot of bacteria on it, and how is that different from being exposed to, you know, let's say farm bacteria, and, and is there danger to farm bacteria? And so, of course, you know, the answer is, I mean, we want to have different exposures, but what might be on a subway pole is not necessarily a very, very diverse number of organisms as compared to, let's say, what we're going to find in soil. Because in one teaspoon of soil, there are as many organisms as there are people on the entire planet. Whereas in a subway, we're talking about what we find in an urban environment, which is much, much more restricted. So we don't necessarily want to go licking the subways, but at the same time, it probably isn't as bad as we think it is either. Um, but I do recommend washing hands with just regular soap after being on subways or being on farms, you know, just because I think that um, it's okay to have some exposure, but we don't need to, you know, pour it into our bodies in that way. In terms of having clean fruits and vegetables, I mean, the goal on the one hand is to actually, when you eat your fruits and vegetables to maybe have a little trace of soil or you know some exposure on the fruits and vegetables. It's not that you want them to be completely free of any exposure. Um, you just want to make sure that that's not going to be a dangerous exposure and that it's not um, some kind of toxic chemical pesticide that actually can cause real damage in our bodies. So for me, I try to grow food. If I can grow food, I buy from farmers markets where hopefully they're not massively power washing all the vegetables and fruit. Um, I do want it to be rinsed. I don't think it needs to be caked with soil. But if you think about, you know, if you go to a pick your own place or if you are picking like a string bean off of a, 
your own plant, you're not necessarily going to go and like scrub it down with something. I mean, you're going to enjoy that right there and then, and that's really how it was intended to be. So for me, having some of that exposure is good. You know, I might like pull something out of my garden and like rub it on my pants or something. Um, but I usually will rinse it, wash it. Um, I might use soap depending on how dirty it is from my own garden or if I'm buying it from the grocery store. Um, I don't really go above and beyond that, but I do try to buy organic or especially biodynamic whenever I can. I mean, I love being in the dirt. I love gardening. I love, you know, being barefoot on the ground. And so gardening and growing things is incredibly important to me. I also love to be in relationship with plants. So that's something that just brings me joy. And I think that's important for every person. And as a physician, um, I really wanted to not just have these things available to my own family, like keeping chickens, or keeping bees, or growing medicinal herbs, or growing food, which I thought was really important for my own kids for many reasons. But also I think when people come to see their doctor and you can take them outside or they see the chickens and they can run out and see that the chickens are laying eggs or take an egg home with them or see that maybe one of the herbs that they take um, every day they can see that beautiful plant growing and maybe the flower and see how pretty it is and connect with it in that way. I think that's really important and it really takes us back to the way that medicine and healing should be practiced, which is that all healing really comes from the earth. So it's important to have a relationship with it. When someone normally goes to a pediatric neurologist, the neurologist will take a very detailed history and do a very detailed exam. Um, specifically to test different parts of the nervous system. And then depending on the problem that they present with, more often than not, um, they're going to get a pharmaceutical as their treatment. And they may also be sent to physical therapy or occupational therapy or um, speech therapy, something of that nature, if they're having some kinds of difficulties with um, you know, learning or development. But ultimately, what's really most commonly offered is a pharmaceutical. And that could be a stimulant for ADHD, or it could be something for behavior, a mood stabilizer for behavior. It could be a medication to help with migraines. Um, it could be something for seizures, right, to help stop seizures. In my practice, um, when I began practicing, I did not want to write a prescription for every single kid that walked in my door, um, particularly for kids who had behavior issues or emotional issues or focus issues, um, I felt like there had to be another way. So I dived into the literature. Essentially, I, I tried to find what was out there that was in food and in nutrition and in nutrients um, and in herbs. And that's really still what I use in my practice as the mainstay to treat children with all those kinds of chronic issues. The first thing that I tell parents, and I think this is across the board, whether a child has an issue or if they're perfectly fine and you don't want them to develop any issues, is to really cut processed food as much as possible, which means really looking to eliminate food chemicals like MSG and aspartame um, or any artificial sweeteners, things like high fructose corn syrup, food dyes, preservatives, all of those are things which can be very disruptive to neurological health. And I've seen very miraculous reversals at times um, simply by just cutting out food chemicals. The next thing I recommend is looking at possible food reactivity. So a child who has any kinds of, um, let's say, eczema or asthma or um, hives or rashes or uh, stomach aches, chronic stomach aches, or constipation, oftentimes they're reacting to food. And when you remove that food, then you see a huge leap in neurologic health or in terms of mood, behavior, all of those things. And the third thing I would say is um, I'm a big fan of, of fat for children. So the brain is made up 60 to 70% of fat. And so healthy fats, um, which can include things like butter or ghee, coconut oil, 
olive oil. Um, I'll even recommend if you know using like marrow um, from from marrow bones in soups or things like that. Um, any pastured eggs. All of those kinds of foods are filled with healthy fats and actually healthy cholesterol, which is critically important for brain health and for mood health. Terrain medicine is really this idea that we are connected to the natural world around us. Inside of us, we have our bioterrain, which is all of our, our organ systems, right? Our, our body and everything that goes on inside of our body. And then outside of us, we have our eco-terrain, which is um, food, soil, plants, water, wind, air, sun, all of the things that are around us. And up until now, it seems like we've really separated those two things. So we think that we can be healthy just in and of ourselves without thinking about our eco-terrain, thinking about the, the world around us. But ultimately, the only way that we can actually be healthy is if the world is healthy with us, and we have to be in alignment with that. So some of what I learned from terrain medicine comes from science. Some of it comes from, I think, common sense ways that you know probably many of us grew up or maybe our grandparents grew up where we were really connected with the outside world. And some of it actually comes from indigenous people that I've studied with for many years and the way that they connect with the natural world, which is profoundly different than how we do in kind of the developed world. Um, so it's about learning how to not just eat well, not just how to be exposed, and not just how to get out into nature and take a hike or garden, which are all incredible things and I think a little bit more obvious, um, but also using different kinds of plant medicines, both ingesting potentially, but also making mandalas with plants or um, you know, working with kind of sacred space and plants. In my practice, I try always to avoid writing a prescription unless I really have to. Uh, but sometimes I have to. I mean, if you have a child who's having seizures, you can't be rigid about this idea that like medication is always bad. It's not always bad. For me, whenever I write a prescription, and I would say it's pretty rare, I always am thinking, how are we going to get this kid off of this medication? I had this family that had twins actually with, um, and they were both having uh, staring spells, which is kind of absence seizures. And we, and they had been on numerous medications and were really not able to tolerate those medications. They had gastrointestinal stuff, or they had drowsiness, or they had other kinds of reactions. And basically both of these kids were having like 100 staring spells a day over the course of the day. Um, and the parents were kind of desperate. And what we realized was these were kids who were also highly allergic, but they were eating a lot of the foods that they were allergic to. And once we cut those foods and really started to help calm down their gut and their immune system, their seizures just completely stopped. And so they were seizure free and actually were able to come off their medications and stopped really having seizures completely. Two twins who were having 100 seizures a day and ultimately really got better, not on medication, but by changing their diet. Neurologists are a very smart group of people and actually are great problem solvers and great detectives. I think the challenge is really how to bring in the idea of lifestyle both because it's really not taught in medical school. Um, I mean, most medical students get not more than a few hours of any kind of nutrition education at all. Um, so the concept of food as medicine is really distant still from most medical students' experience. But even more so, the idea of not wanting to use medications as much, right? Like, why not use medications if you have them? because medications are a band-aid. First of all, they're not getting to the root cause of the problem. And in addition to that, they have a lot of side effects. If you go out into the woods 
and immerse yourself in the woods for an hour. And this is actually, this is something that's well studied, mostly in Japan, but also in other parts of the world. And it's been looked at in children too. Focus is better, executive function is better, mood is better, sleep is better, natural killer cells increase, which means your immune system is stronger. Anti-cancer proteins are produced in greater amounts, which means you're fighting cancer. That's simply by going for a walk in the woods. You're more creative. I mean, literally, there's no pill, there's no medication, there's no even combination of medications that can achieve that. And in Japan, actually, because it's a part of the culture there, this concept of shinrin-yoku, or forest bathing, this is something that's done all the time, and it's studied, and it's prescribed. But generally speaking, we're not doing that in neurology. And it's probably one of the most powerful things we could really offer to people.